if you're able, please remain standing for the reading of Scripture. Our scripture this morning will be found in Genesis chapter 24, verses 50 through 61. Again, that's Genesis 24, 50 through 61. Genesis 24, 50 through 61 reads as follows. Thus Laban and Bethel replied, The matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you bad or good. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servants heard their, their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. The servant bought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. But her brother and her husband said, let the girl stay with us a few days, say 10. Afterward, she may go. He said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, we will call the girl and consult her wishes. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Thus they, spent, thus they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse with Abraham's servants and her and his men, they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. Then Rebekah arose with her maids, and they mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. May the Lord have a blessing for the reading of his word. You may be seated. And at this time, I pray this team will come and minister. Good morning. Good morning. Our opening song this morning is in our hymnal, Psalm 644. Philippians 3 and 8, it says, I consider everything a loss compared to surpassing greatness.
Thank you. 
the last congregation is on. It's found on. I'm sorry. I have to the page. 541. The joy of the Lord. I had a great The joy of the Lord. It says in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. The joy of the Lord is Stress. your strength. Chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. I'm 
going to read 14 through 20. And now I'm going to ask you to read 21 through 25. Can you handle that this morning? Oh, yes. Even though, even though you're lacking an hour of sleep? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I think I text Sister Margo earlier in the week and asked her to send out a text to remind everyone. Um, but not to put it all on her. I forgot to text her again. I think I texted you about 11 o'clock at night. I thought I did. See, I blame it on the sin nature. Blame it on the sin nature. But anyway, since we forgot to get out the word, I think what we'll do is the first person that walks in and they have that all in all look, I think I'm going to go back to the beginning of the message. Just for the end. All right, Romans 7, I'll read 14 through 20. We'll read 21 through 25, and then you can be seated. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. How many can relate to that? <laughs> and if I do the very thing that I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing that I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Three. I find in the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God and the inner man, but I see a different law of the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, for the word flesh. 
And you'll see that used interchangeably in Romans from 6 through 8. The Greek word is sarex. And this can be confusing because the word flesh and sin nature are used interchangeably. There are at least four different ways the term sinful nature or flesh is used in the Bible. Number one, speaking of physical matter, the physical matter that makes up the human body. Number two, the human body itself. Number three, a human being or the human race. But Paul's most characteristic use of the term sarex is with the reference to the rebellious human nature. Human value seems, the human value system that stands in opposition to God's value system. Let me repeat that. Paul speaks most often of the rebellious human nature, the human value system that stands in opposition to God's value system. Here, flesh is the body which is dominated by sin. The unregenerated and sinful state. The NIV nearly consistently translates the meaning of flesh as sinful nature. The word flesh appears with this fourth definition in three verses I want us to take a look at today. First of all, let's turn to Romans 6 and 19. Turn to Romans chapter 6, verse 19. Romans 6 and 19. If you're there, read. I am speaking in the prayers for God's living in your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to the impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Let's take a look at one more verse. Chapter 7 and verse 18. Chapter 7, verse 18. If you're there, begin reading. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that it is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. So, just so that you know, the same sin nature that you have in you is the same sin nature in all mankind. It's the same sin nature that was possessed by Hitler, Stalin, and Jeffrey Dahmer. What does that mean? That means that we all have that same capacity to sin at a diabolical level. It's the same sin nature. Let's give an example of the sin nature. Not that we need a lot. All we have to do is look in the mirror. <laughs> Think about a child. No one has to teach a child to lie or be selfish. Rather, we go to great lengths to teach a child to tell the truth and put others first. Simple behavior comes naturally. Am I in the house? Yes, the news is filled with tragic examples of mankind acting badly. Whenever, wherever people are, there is trouble. Charles Spurgeon said, and I quote, as the salt flavors every drop in the Atlantic, so does sin affect every atom of our nature. Mm -hmm. It is so sadly there, so abundantly there, and if you cannot detect it, guess what? We are deceiving ourselves. Amen. So how did we get this sin? Right? I didn't want it, but I have it. How did we get it? Sin was imputed into us. And let's take a look at the proof behind that. Romans 5 and 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. A couple of interesting things in that verse. 
Wherefore, as by one man. I hate to break it to the fellas. Guess how sin entered into the world. Guess who has responsibility for that? The man. And death by sin. It doesn't say sin. It says as death by sin. So what passed upon all men? Death. For all have sinned. Genesis 3 records the disobedience of Adam and Eve. By that one act, sin entered into their nature. They were immediately stricken with a sense of shame and unfitness, and they hid from God's presence. Turn to Genesis 3, chapter 3, verse 8. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. We're talking about the imputing of sin. You're there, read. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Why did they hide themselves? When God created Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden, he called them good. Everything was perfect, along with the rest of creation. They had no sin at this point in time. However, their eating of the forbidden fruit had a devastating spiritual effect on us all. Adam and Eve's children did not follow the good creation of God. In fact, the first child mentioned in Scripture came, did what? Murdered his brother. Every person born since his likewise entered the world in the likeness of Adam, inheriting the sinful nature that stands in need of redemption by the grace of God. The word impute means to ascribe to or to reckon over. Let me give you an example of that. When we make a purchase with the credit card, the value of that purchase is imputed to our account. Are we getting it? Mm-hmm. In the same way, the sin of Adam is imputed to the human race which sprang from heaven. This is done because Adam was both the seminal and the representative head of the human race. Just as, a citizen, as citizens, we live with the consequences and decisions made by our representatives in government, so we live with the consequences of our representative decision in the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. Some might view the imputation of Adam's sin to the human race as somehow unfair or unjust by God. One, God is God. Amen. And never unjust. Amen. It's Amen. not a part of his character. Second of all, we would have taken a by ourselves. Why? Simply because we would have also questioned God's word. Just as we do today. Third, it would really be bad, but God also offers to impute Christ's righteousness in us, all who believe. The biblical remedy for imputed sin is the imputed righteousness of Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 I'll really be shouting for that one. Teach us. In Psalm 51 and 5, David says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David saw himself as a man whose sinful parents had brought forth a sinful child. David recognized that he possessed a nature that, that would sin and fall short of God's glory. David's son Solomon would later write, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. There is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. The prophet Jeremiah also comments 
on our sin nature. He says in Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. The King James Version says wicked. Who can understand it? Isaiah says we have all become like the one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind. They all take us away. Bottom line is we all have a sin nature that has been a part of us since the moment we were conceived. The Apostle John notes, if we say that we have no sin nature, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Mm -hmm. In Romans 5 and 12, Paul writes, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. Adam's sin started it all, and now we are all sinners. Those who deny the sin nature are self-deceived. The sin nature is universal in humanity. All of us have a sin nature, and it affects every part of us. This is what is called the doctrine of total depravity. All of us have gone astray, as Isaiah says. Paul admits in the verse that we read, the trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin, in Romans 7 and 14. Yes. Paul was in his sinful nature a slave to the law of sin, as so we. Solomon concurs with this statement. He says, indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Ecclesiastes 7 and 20. The Apostle John perhaps put it most bluntly, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So for the record, we all have a sin nature. We all have a sin nature. So what does the sin nature look like? What does it look like? Man in his present fallen state is not basically good, as we are told, and the scriptures teach. He is deceitful and cunning. Yes, there is some good in man, the remnant of God's image in which he was formed, but the good is corrupted. So if I have a glass of water, clear, fresh spring water, crystal clear, and I add dirt to it, what happens? Does it become clean? No, no it becomes dirty. Such is the impact of the sin nature. Wow. All is a mixture of good and evil, and certainly man's flesh is corrupt. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. Romans 7 18. We talk about what sin looks like. All is somewhat corrupt, and therefore, even the good in us cannot be trusted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus recognized this when he taught on the heart or core of man. Yes. Romans 3, 9 through 19 reads, What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good not either one. Amen. Their throats are, in open, are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of filth to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I really contemplated that last verse throughout the week. 
And I did some inner reflection. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And so I asked myself the question, and I asked the question of you today. Do you have a healthy fear or respect for God? Uh -huh. It may be hard for us to do today in the day of grace. It wouldn't have been in the Old Testament because some of us would have fallen into a hole or been stoned or found the retribution of God through our acts. Do you have a healthy fear or reverence or respect for the Lord? The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. This is in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. They are sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousies, fits of rage, self-ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I didn't say that. God's word. The flesh motivates the selfishness we sometimes feel, the whining about our circumstances, and the petty jealousies, the jockeying for, for power in the office and in our marriages, the lure of pornography, the desire for money and possessions, and all the rest. That's what the sin nature looks like. Paul teaches that the fallen human nature is inherently rebellious against God. We inherited this nature from Adam, and unfortunately, it was not eradicated when we became Christians. Mm -hmm. Did you hear me? Yeah. We inherited this nature from Adam, and unfortunately, it was not eradicated when we became Christians. Mm -hmm. That's a good lesson for a new believer to learn. Amen. Everything is not perfect when you become a believer. Yeah. But there is a battle, and we'll talk about that later. The fallen human nature is inherently rebellious against God. You know, if we don't keep our rebellious nature, our sin man, in check, he wakes up rebellious against God. Yeah. Wakes up rebellious against God. Because yes. it is human nature, or it's natural. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about the contrasting impact on believers versus non-believers. The sin nature and the impact or the impact or effect affects the believer different than the non-believer. First of all, I'm going to start with the believer. Are you with me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And listen that. Do we need a cafe? Do we need some coffee set up? Also? <laughs> listen to our sleep. I'm feeling it. I don't know about anybody else. The unfortunate result of our sin nature is that we sin. We agree? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Being sinners by nature, we can't help but sin. This sin separates us from the perfect, sinless God. Yet God has provided a way to receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus spoke of salva salvation as being born again. Born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say this to you. You must be born again. Only Christians can overcome the sin nature within us. And how does that happen? Because we are born again. Yes. We are given yes. a new nature. When a person trusts in Christ for salvation, he or she receives a new nature, the new nature that Jesus is talking about, the shared in Nicodemus. The natural man becomes spiritual. You see that in 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. Believers have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creation. 
So now we have this new nature. As we seek to understand the flesh and understand the new nature, it is important to see that there is a war within us. There is a war within us that wars against our soul. And that's what we read in Romans 7, 14 through 25. I'm going to read it to you again in the NIV version. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for, I, for what I want to do, I do not do. Who is that? The old man or the new man? But what I hate, I do. Who is that speaking? The new man. Hate sin, right? Say it with me. And if we do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is a sin living within me, the old man. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is, in my sinful nature, the old man. For I have the desires to do what is good, the new nature, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This is, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. That's the new man. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Are you getting it? Yes. yes. Wow. What a wretched man I am. Mm -hmm. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject that is subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivered me yes. through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes. Amen. Great. The Apostle Paul explains the battle that rages continually, even in the most spiritual, mature person. So no matter what level of Christian you are, <laughs> There's a battle going on with him. Yes. 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 He laments that he does he does what he doesn't want to do, and in fact does the evil he detests. Can you relate? Okay. He okay. says that it's the result of the sin living in me, the old man. But he delights in God's law according to his inner being. But he sees another law at work. The members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner. That's an interesting context. The member of my body is referred to the old man, but waging war against the law of my mind is the new man. Yes. Think about that. Mm -hmm. And making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. Paul's point is that the battle is real. Mm -hmm. And it is one yes. Christian's Wage through out our lives. Amen. The good news is, if you are in the battle, it is evident that you have a new spiritual Amen. man Amen. within you. Given when you become born again, thank you, Jesus. Amen. So, as a Christian, if you feel this tug of war, the things that I don't want to do, I do. The things that I do want to do, I don't. And if I do, they're because of the new man. It's good news. Yeah. It's evident that you are born again. Mm. This term waging war, to be at war, from anti, over against, hostile opposition, to engage in a conflict, wage, battle, or fight. So let me ask you this question. If you're a Christian, you're in the battle, right? Mm -hmm. My question to you is, what is your battle strategy? Mm -hmm. I, I've never been in war, I've never been in the service. 
I did say a Halloween in one, but that wasn't real. <laughs> you guys must be the people that flip through the commercials. <laughs> I've never been in, in service, I've never been in war, but everything I understand about it, there's strategy involved. So as a Christian, when you're waging this war, what is your battle strategy? I'll be transparent. I have to put my old man under subjection daily. Amen. If I wake up and I don't, guess what happens? Guess which man takes control? The mind that is set on the flesh, the Bible says, is hostile to God. This concurs with several other New Testament references that characterizes the Christian life as a conflict. Galatians 5 and 17 says the flesh and the spirit are in conflict with each other. James 4 and 1 tells us what cause fights and quarrels among you. Don't they come from your desires to battle within you? What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? 1 Peter 2 and 11 tells us, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world. You got need to repeat that. Christians, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world. Yes. You know this isn't our home, right? Yes. Amen. Amen. But we're settling in, though. We're settling in. I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. No doubt, there is an ongoing battle raging within every Christian. The old man here is interpreted as a former way of life, that of the unbeliever. In this sense, the Christian has two competing capacities within him or her. The old capacity to sin and the new capacity to resist sinning follow Christ. Yes. I was thinking on the way here to church as I listened to quote unquote gospel music that's even questionable. I, I hear so many songs about um, you know this is my season and I have Satan under my feet and I have Satan under control I mean, let's be honest. Why would Satan be bothered with us? We can't keep the old man under control. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the flesh. Yeah. I mean, how are you going to have your foot on Satan? Go <laughs> get a workout. <laughs> Listen to them songs, except when you got Satan. Your, our flesh is enough. Yeah. Yeah. All right, turning the, turn yeah. the man according to the spiritual man is enough. Yes, yes, yes. At the moment of our conversion, the Christian receives. A new nature. Thank God. It is instantaneous. Sanctification, on the other hand, is a process by which God develops our new nature. Yeah. Enabling us to grow into more holiness through time. So we repeat that. So once we become a believer, we instantaneously receive this new nature. But the process of sanctification is a process by which God develops our new nature. Amen. In other words, the Christian race is a marathon Amen. and not a sprint. Amen. 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 And if we're fighting this battle, Amen. be encouraged. Yes. Sanctification is through Jesus Christ. Amen. And the work that he started in us, he will what? Oh, the work that Christ started in us, he what? You don't have to sound too sure about that. I know you're going through it, but that's God's promise. Yes. This is a continuous process with many victories and some defeats as the new nature battles with the tent of the old nature which resides in us. The old nature, the flesh. We still have the capacity for sin as well, but, he now, but we now have the ability to resist sin and more importantly, desire to resist sin and to live God. Yes. Did you hear me? Yes. 
We still have the capacity to sin, mm. but we now, through the new man, have the ability to resist sin, Absolutely. and more importantly, the desire to resist and live God. When Christ was crucified, the old man was crucified with him, Amen. resulting in Christians no longer being slave to sin. Great. Romans 6 and 6. We have been set free from sin and now have become slaves to righteousness. Great. Romans 6 and 18. As I stand here in the transparency, I don't know about the rest of you. Maybe you're, maybe you're a lot holier than me, but I have to put this, the old man under subjection every day. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And it might behoove us all to be a little more transparent. Because we're good at playing Sunday church. Yeah. We, all look, we look, all look sanctified and holy, but we're still dealing with the battle. Yes. Yes. Sometimes I wonder if this is something that deters the non-believer to convert. Yes. I'm trying to say it. Just out of pressure to try to live up to the expectations that they think they see in us on Sunday. Uh -huh. yes. I'm told, <laughs> well, I'll speak for myself. I'm here to work out my salvation in fear mm -hmm. and truth. Yes. Yes. Through serving God serving God's people, and learning and understanding his word. Yes. Yes. So we get away with it on Sunday, <laughs> but invite someone to come stay with you for about a month. <laughs> yes. Yes. You might be able to live up to that holiness, that self-righteous act for a couple weeks, <laughs> for about day 23, <laughs> and they get on your nerves, <laughs> right? And, and they left toothpaste, all over the fast food sink, right? Through the tiles on the floor, they will see the old man. <laughs> so, since we have this new nature, how are we as believers to live? What kind of okay, we're doing that. Since we now have this new nature, how are we as believers to live? Turn to Romans 8. I want you to look at verses 5 through 8. Romans 8, verses 5 through 8. And then I will read verses 12 through 17. Romans 8, 5 through 8. Are you okay? I know some of you are shocked because you, you, you know you have the same nature now. <laughs> if you're there, read. For those who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the name. What is that? Set what? Set your eyes on the things of the flesh. Okay. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law. For it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So when we think about it, I mean, none of us, well, most of us, who are believers, we don't wake up wanting to be hostile to God. <laughs> I mean, I don't think we do. Amen. But it's a product of the old man. Mm. It's natural. Yes. That's why it tells us that we are to set our mind on what? The things of the spirit versus the things of the flesh. Mm. Verses 12 through 17 read, I'm going to read out of the NIV version. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. We have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Again, rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption 
to sonship. That's what I was talking about early. If you realize or recognize this battle, it's a sign that you are saved. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. Amen. The Spirit of God takes up residence in each believer, supplying the power we need yes. to overcome the pull of sin, the sin nature of us. Yes. No one born of God makes a practice of sin. For God's seed, seed abides within him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. First John 3 and 9. God's ultimate plan for us is total sex, sanctification when we see Christ. God's ultimate plan for us is total sanctification when we see Christ. We as believers are encouraged to put to death the deeds of the body, Romans 8, 13. To put to death that which makes the Christian sin and to put aside other sin such as anger, wrath, malice, Colossians 3 and 8. All this to say that Christians have two natures, the old and the new, but the new nature needs continual renewal. We find that in Colossians 3 and 10. How does the new nature receive continual renewing? It's not a secret. It's in the word of God. This renewing, of course, is a lifetime process for the Christian. It's a lifetime process for the Christian. So you can expect to be in battle until you see Jesus. Even though the battle against sin is constant, we are no longer under the control of sin. The believer is truly a new creation in Christ. Yes. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Aren't you happy about that? <laughs> Sanctification is coming. Yep. Keep fighting the good faith against the old man. Uh -huh. Jesus promised he will finish when he started. Be encouraged today if you are struggling with the old man. Psalms 2111 sums it up perfectly. Serve the Lord with fear, there's that word again, or reverence or respect, and rejoice with trembling. We work, our, our, work out our salvation by going to the very source of our salvation, the Word of God, wherein we, wherein we renew our hearts and minds by that Romans 12, 1 and 2. Coming into His presence with the spirit of reverence and awe. Quickly, as we prepare to close, let's talk about the impact of sin on the non-believer. We talked about the impact and effect of the same nature on the Christian because now we have two natures. Let's talk about the non believer. The unfortunate result of our sin nature is that we sin. Being sinners by nature, we cannot help but sin. These sins, of course, separate us from a perfect and sinless God. Yet, God has provided a way to receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Jesus, as we mentioned earlier, spoke to Nicodemus of salvation as being born again. The Christian has two competing capacities within him or her, the old and the new man. The unbeliever does not. He does not have the capacity for godliness because he has only one nature. That's the sin nature. That's not to say that he can't do good or good works, but his motivations for these works is always tainted by his sinfulness. In addition, he or she cannot resist sinning 
because he doesn't have the capacity to do so. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This is the only remedy for the non-believer. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace yeah. through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. Yeah. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of blood to be received by faith. So what is that saying if you're not a believer? You don't have the capacity to resist sin on your own. Amen. You need to become a new creature through Jesus Christ. Amen. There's only one person in the history of the world who, do not, who did not have a sin nature. Jesus Christ, his virgin birth, birth allowed him to enter our world while bypassing the curse passed down from Adam. You see, through one man, death came upon all. But through another man, Jesus Christ, life is given to those who receive him. It is through Christ that we become born again. The Bible tells us that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit, John 3 and 6. When we are born of Adam, we inherit his sin nature. But when we are born again in Christ, we inherit a new nature. Yeah. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. We praise God Amen. for the salvation oh, yeah. in the man and through the man, the sinless man, yes. Jesus Christ.
thank God for the word of God. Amen. 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 That same nature. I know we talked about that in Sunday school and some of those scriptures this morning. Yeah. So this confirms the word of God. Amen. So if you're bound with the flesh and walk by the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of your flesh. So Pastor Smith, thank you for the word today. Amen. 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 At this time, before our uh, announcement, I'm going to discuss it. You know, we read all the scriptures that have been confirmed in the two or three when we read the scriptures. Well, Sister Margot, I have to say, uh, he did send me the text message because I was included in that text. So, <laughs> he, was talking, he, was, he was talking about that microphone, so I think maybe he got distracted. <laughs> she knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> So he did send the story, but that's okay. We got it all straight. At this time, let our men come and receive our offering. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for the word and your truth. Lord, we pray, Lord, as we look to get back to you, what you have blessed us with. We thank you, Lord, for providing. And Lord, may uh, it come from a heart of sincere gratitude towards you. Let it be used for the building up of your kingdom. And we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.